Welcome to our live webinar event, Demystifying NPSH and Understanding How the New HI Standard Can Impact Your Operation. My name is Greg Danino, and I will be your moderator for today's call. Our speakers today are Simon Bradshaw, Director of API Product Development and Technology at ITT Gould Pumps, and Rich Nardone, Global Product Manager at ITT Gould Pumps. They'll be providing an educational presentation to explain the basic physics and calculations behind net positive suction head, the consequences of not properly accounting for NPSH, and the new Hydraulic Institute standard for NPSH margins. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please submit your questions during the webinar using the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Simon and Rich will also share a question and answer summary via email in the near future to cover many of your questions that they may not have time to address at the end of today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that the conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Simon. Simon, you may begin. Thanks, and uh, thanks for everybody who showed up today. Uh, seems like there's a lot of interest in this topic, so let's get uh, right to it. So for our agenda, I've got a few things we're going to cover here. Um, we're going to cover the physics behind cavitation. We're going to cover how to calculate NPSHA. We're going to cover NPSH testing. We're going to cover calculating the NPSH margin, which includes the you know, some examples with the new Hydraulic Institute standard on NPSH margin. Um, so just before we kind of go into this, this is a, a one-hour webinar. It's, a, it's an introduction to these topics. Um, we're going to cover them in as much depth as, as we can and do them the best justice we can. If you, have, after watching this, you have interest in NPSH, cavitation, all the rest of it, there is an excellent short course at the Pump Symposium every year. Uh, that you can attend. It's a one-day course, and you will learn about these uh, topics in much more detail than we can cover here in an hour. So let's go go right along. Um, so cavitation, my preferred definition. There's a bunch of definitions out there. Um, you can pick one. I happen to like this one because I wrote it, but it's yeah, it is what it is. So. Cavitation means the partial evaporation of liquid in the system. So you have a cavity in which vapor is created when the, the, the static pressure in the flow of the liquid drops below the vapor pressure of that liquid. So what happens then is this bubble starts to appear. Um, some fluid evaporates and you have two-phase flow. Then um, as, the, uh, as you pass through to a, a region where the static pressure again exceeds the vapor pressure, that those vapor bubbles will condense or implode, and um, this is cavitation as we know it. If the, ca if the size of the, these vapor bubbles is, is large enough, you will get impairment of the, the head and efficiency of the pump. You'll get a lot of noise and vibration usually, and you may also get damage of the components uh, due to cavitation erosion, and also because of the higher vibration, you may also damage ancillary components like bearings, seals, etc. So that's the, the basic definition as I would apply it. Let's look at uh, cavitation as a visualization. So to start off here, just to get you in the mood, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a Venturi, which is basically just a restriction in a, in, a, in a pipe, just to get everybody situated. Everybody pretty much understands, I think, a, a Venturi and what it does. So basically what we're showing on this diagram is, is we're applying a Venturi to the pipe, and as, as the uh, fluid accelerates in that Venturi, in this example, the static pressure in that fluid according to the, the Bernoulli's equation, drops below the vapor pressure of the fluid and bubbles start to first appear and then grow, or cavitation bubbles. Okay, So what will happen is they will continue to grow until we reach the other side of the Venturi and the, the static pressure starts to rise again. Uh, and once it gets above the vapor pressure, the bubbles will start to collapse. And what, what we're sort of showing there is the, the, the shape these bubbles form as they collapse. It's not uniform. They sort of collapse in on themselves, and you get this kind of jetting core that occurs. Um, 
and we'll cover that in a little more detail in the next slide. So if we, if we zoom in a little bit on the bubbles and what's happening here, um, when these bubbles collapse, it creates a really intense pressure uh, field up to, depends who you read, um, I, I took this, this from Gulick, Gulick Centrifugal Pumps book, 15,000 PSI, 1,000 bar. I've seen higher figures than that, actually. I guess it depends which paper you read. And some severe shock waves. The, the, these pressure and shock waves, if they occur near a metal or, in fact, any surface, um, it may exceed the material strength and it, it can fatigue the material. That, that fatigued material will then break away creating the, this sort of pitting, pitted sort of matte surface that you see when there's cavitation attack. And they, they tend to become a concentration point for further bubble collapse as well, because it's, it's now starting to change the geometry of the, the, the part. So that's really what we're showing here with the, the bubble as, as, it, as it collapses. And you can see the, the, the jetting core at the, at the far right, the diagram there, as it collapses. So if we then take this uh, cavitation visualization and we say, OK, what's happening inside our pump? What we have at the, the top left there is a, is a cross-section through an end, a standard end suction pump, uh, an OH1 or an OH2. And we've, we've kind of divided the, the, the region of the pump up into areas from A through E, uh, with A to B being the, the suction flange of the pump. And C and D being around the leading, lead, coming up to the leading edge of the impeller vane. So what happens inside the pump is, is that uh, you, know, you, you have a pressure at the, the suction flange of the pump. That, that, <coughs> that um, uh, pressure continues to drop uh, as, as the, the fluid progresses through the pump, such that the, the region of lowest pressure is generally going to occur around the leading edge of the vein, which is region D uh, shown on this diagram. And if you're going to get cavitation, which in most pumps you are, that's where it's going to occur uh, first. So let's go along to the next slide. And if we took a, we do a plan view of the uh, pump impeller, we kind of look at, look in, or look in the eye of the impeller. Uh, what you would see there, if, if, you could, if you could see the pump running, would be a bubble inception at or near the leading edge of the vein, the impeller vein, and then the bubbles will grow, and then as the pressure increases through the impeller, eventually it will get back above the vapor pressure of the fluid, and you'll get bubble collapse some distance um, further, further along the vein. Um, and you know, depending on the, the geometry of the pump and, and the, the impeller vein, the exact region that that occurs will vary. Um, but it's, it's typically, some typically some distance away from the leading edge. So that's really what that, um, that shows. Now, if we go to the, the next slide, you'll see, and I'm sure you've all seen examples. Uh, there's plenty, of, uh, plenty out there if you Google cavitation damage of impeller there's, there's plenty more than this, some, some quite interesting, actually. This is an impeller, it happens to be one of ours, I believe, um, that has incurred pretty severe cavitation damage. So if you look at the vein um, adjacent to the five on the tape measure there, you can see that the, the vein towards the, the shroud of the impeller is basically totally eaten away. It's actually not there anymore. So this would be pretty what we would call pretty, pretty severe cavitation damage because you've actually gone all the way through the thickness of the vein and it would definitely be a, uh, a, what we would classify as a severe failure. And, and you can get variations to this. Some are just, you get light frosting on it, it's still cavitation damage, it just hasn't damaged very much or to anything like the same extent. So, one of the things I'd, I, I'll keep keep going on about as we go through the uh, go through the webinar is that cavitation is pretty much present in a, in every pump, and you don't you can you don't need to believe me right now, but you'll you'll see later on I'll I'll demonstrate it for you quite graphically. So 
one of one of the one of the important considerations if if you have cavitation which you most likely do is what is the resistance of of the material of my pump to that cavitation and there are a number of uh, you know correlations of this out there which are are um, around this is one of them and basically what we've taken is a bunch of different materials uh, starting with cast iron and the the x-axis on this graph uh, is is relative resistance to erosion or cavitation erosion and so the, the further right it, the, the material goes on the bars that that means it has more resistance to cavitation so if you look at cast iron um, it really isn't terribly resistant to cavitation not at all um, it's okay uh, if you have very small amounts of cavitation but it's not terribly resistant. And then we go up through various materials, um, carbon steel, um, 316 stainless, which is an, an austenitic stainless, which would be CF8M on this graph, and through titanium, uh, aluminium, bronze. And then really the, the, the top material that typically gets, gets specced for um, cavitation resistance of, of most likely the impeller of the pump is a martensitic stainless steel or CA6NM that's, that's listed at the top there, uh, which is also some people know it as chrome steel or 13.4, depends what part of the world you're in. And this is typically the the top material that would be applied to prevent um, cavitation resistance. Now. I imagine there'll be some people who raise their hands and say, oh, well, what about material X or material Y? And they're right. There are some exotic materials that are out there, and I, I use the term exotic because they're not in general production. But you can get materials that have significantly more cavitation resistance than CA6NM. The issue is they, they're typically um, only available from a few vendors. They tend to cost significantly more, and in some instances, they may be harder to manufacture. So they tend to be, I'm not saying they, they, they're bad or anything like that, they tend to be applied for a specific uh, cavitation problem that might be occurring on a pump, or maybe for repair of cavitation damage on a pump or something like that. So they're out there, you, you, you can be aware of them. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend or, or otherwise any, any particular material, but th there are ones that are better. So um, with that, we're going to do a poll, and Rich is going to do the poll because he loves polls, <laughs> and I don't. Thank you, Simon. This is the interactive portion of our presentation. Uh, you should see a question up on the screen. Uh, which of the following are not figured in the calculation of NPSH A or NPSH available? The pressure at the pump suction, the friction pressure loss in the suction pipe, the density of the fluid, or the rotational speed of the impeller eye. Uh, and all four of these somehow come into play uh, throughout this presentation, uh, but uh, in, in calculating NPSH available, there's really just one that, uh, that doesn't apply, uh, but it does apply an equation that we will get to later. Check they're all awake, right? See how many people answered. All right, what do we have? Uh, do we have results? We do. 77% uh, of you are correct. Uh, the rotational speed of the eye of the impeller is not used in the calculation of the NPSH available. Uh, the other three either are or can be. Uh, depending on the equation that uh, that you're familiar with in calculating NPSH, uh, density may or may not be in there, uh, but it is uh, indirectly. So let's uh, let's continue on, and we'll talk about uh, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, NPSH and calculating NPSH. So NPSH is defined as being the absolute suction head at the eye of the impeller. Uh, less the vapor pressure, and that is expressed in terms of uh, head, be it in feet or meters. Uh, but we need to distinguish between the NPSH of the pump, which is necessary to partially 
suppress cavitation. And it, it's important to note that very few pumps require total suppression. Uh, so we have to differentiate between the NPSH of the pump, which is the NPSH required or NPSHR, versus NPSH available, which is what the system is providing to the pump and what's available. So let's take a look at the first equation for calculating NPSH. Uh, this involves the pressure on the suction side, so whether it be due to atmosphere uh, and tank elevation, or if it's an enclosed tank, uh, it could be the, the pressure inside that tank, uh, and that could be uh, above or below atmospheric. So you have to account for that pressure plus the elevation, whether that be positive or negative. The friction loss uh, in the suction pipe, uh, there's the vapor pressure of the fluid, and then density and the gravitational constant comes into play when you're converting between pressures and feet or, uh, or uh, meters. And it's, uh, it's also important to note that atmospheric pressure provides 14.7 PSI or one bar at sea level, okay? And that changes uh, when you get to increased elevations. Just like, uh, you know, you've all heard the example of boiling a pot of water. Uh, down at sea level, it takes uh, 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, but up on the mountain, it's gonna take substantially less because there's less air pressure up there. The second equation is where instead of using pressures and converting that to feet or meters, here you do that conversion up front and the equation is all in feet or meters. So it's the pressure on the surface of the fluid, again, whether that be atmospheric if the tank is open or whatever pressure is enclosed in that, uh, that tank. The suction head, Okay, you add the, the pressure on the surface of the fluid plus the suction head, and then you subtract off the friction loss in the pipe and the vapor pressure. And once again, we've got that note about uh, atmospheric pressure. The vapor pressure typically changes with changing temperatures. Uh, so you take a look at the, a chart here that has some water properties. Uh, you can see with increasing temperatures, your specific gravity decreases, uh, and that's related to your density, so your density is also going to decrease, and your vapor pressure is going to increase, and we show it here in both PSI and bar. So let's work our way through an example. Here we have a, a typical pump installation. We've got a positive suction head, the tank is open to atmosphere above the pump suction. Uh, in this case, we have a uh, vapor pressure of 0 0.032 bar and a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So we have to figure our uh, suction pressure. So you've got atmospheric plus your static elevation of six meters. And we've got atmospheric is one bar plus the six meters converted to a bar comes to 0.59, so your P sub S is 1.59 bar. Uh, putting the rest of that into the, into the equation, you've got that 1.59 bar less your pipe friction, which is shown up above the pump in the box there of 0.3 bar, less your vapor pressure of 0 0. Uh, 0 0.032, Okay, and convert that over to uh, meters, and you're looking at an NPSH available of 12.8 meters. Okay. Now we're going to shift gears on you a little bit, and we're going to throw a couple of curveballs at you. Now instead of a positive suction head, you now have uh, the, tank, the suction tank below the pump. You're on a lift condition. Uh, it's still open to atmosphere. However, you're at an altitude of... 9,500 feet. So because you're up at altitude, you have less air pressure, you've got less atmospheric pressure. The equation for your 
suction pressure is the same, all right? It's P atmospheric, which now is 10.3, uh, minus your static elevation because the pump is below, or the suction tank is below the pump. Converting that to PSI, you end up with 9 PSI, 9.0 PSI. Putting that in the equation, you've got 9 less your 4.4 PSI of suction pipe loss, less your 0.46 PSI vapor pressure, and converting that to feet, you end up with an NPSH available of 9.5 feet. And Simon will now take you through an NPSH test. Okay, so <clears throat> Rich uh, took you through calculating NPSHA, which is the, the system side of saying, okay, what do I actually have available to give to the pump in a given situation? I'm gonna talk about NPSHR or NPSH3, and as you'll see, the, the, they're basically equivalent. Uh, um, and it's interesting, I, I, I got a couple of questions before this uh, webinar, uh, and people were asking me, how do you calculate NPSHR um, as a manufacturer? And the answer is we don't. What we do is we do tests, uh, and we love tests. Tests are fun. You can play around all day with making pumps go around and, and pumping water around the test loop. Uh, but they have a, they have a uh, you know, NPSHR is a, is a critical quantity and it's important to, to test and, and validate it. So that's what we, we do. So basically, I'm going to take you through how we do an NPSH test. Um, so what we do is we hold the flow constant, we pick a flow, um, and then we reduce the NPSH available to the pump. Uh, basically, kind of how Rich described, we just lower it down, we keep reducing the, the pressure and, until uh, we we, we pull what is called a knee curve, and that's shown on the left-hand side of this, this slide. If you look along the uh, x-axis is pump NPSH in feet, and then on the y-axis is the, the pump generated or, or developed head. And well, as we lower the NPSH, at some point the, uh, the pump developed head will basically almost drop off a cliff. It looks, like a, it looks like a bent knee, which is why we call it a knee curve in, in this scenario. And the, the area that I've highlighted a, as with a star is where the pump head has been reduced by 3% to 97% of its original value, of course. So we do that, and then that forms one point on our NPSH curve, which maps over to the, the um, the graph on the right-hand side, which has the pump flow in gallons per minute and the pump NPSHR or NPSH3 on the y-axis. And so basically, we have to repeat this test for every flow point that we need the information for. And as you can imagine, that, that can take a while. So doing an NPSH test is actually quite time-consuming to, to do. And you know, you, you have to do all these flow points, and for each one, you have to go through this process of reducing the the NPSH into the pump and, until the um, the pump head degrades sufficiently. So let's go to the next slide. So we're doing our NPSH test, and um, the, there's a bunch of acronyms that that people bounce around, and and I'm not sure they're always applied quite correctly. So let's just go through them just for the, the purposes of clarification. So what, what's important is, um, as I said, is, is the number after the NPSH. Uh, so NPSH3, which I put in brackets NPSHR, is the, the NPSH at which pump head is reduced by 3%. And, and typically now pretty much everybody says that's what NPSHR is, um, but there are other definitions. For example, some uh, customers, oh, it's, it's rare, but I, we do see it um, uh, on a reasonably regular basis, they want to know uh, what, what is the NPSH at which the pump head is only reduced by 1%, and this is called NPSH1 for obvious reasons. There's also NPSH0, which is the NPSH at which the pump head is not reduced at all. Now that one's kind of tricky to determine because it's a little hard to work out where, 
where you're actually not affecting the head, but uh, occasionally that one gets asked for. Then we also have uh, NPSH 40K, and that's the NPSH at which the impeller will have a 40,000 hour life. That tends to get, you get that specified quite often for boiler feed pumps and, and you know, large uh, critical pumps. The, you know, people want to know that their, their impeller is going to um, last in the application. Though I, I would note the, the definition of life is that you, you've only reduced the vein thickness by around 50 to 75 percent. So damage is still occurring, but as long as you haven't gone all the way through, you're good to go. And then finally, uh, we have NPSHI, and the I stands for inception or the start of, it, of, of where cavitation occurs. So this is the NPSH where cavitation first starts to appear, um, and it's very, di very distinct from NPSH, the other NPSH values, as we'll see on the next slide. So here's, here's one of the things I see a lot. Again, a, a very, very common misconception. I'm going to do my best to, to, to um, correct it. A lot of the time you'll see people say, as long as NPSH available is above the NPSH3, there is no cavitation. And that is completely wrong. It's, it, if, if you get nothing else out of this webinar, the concept that just by having a little bit more NPSH available then NPSH3, you're going to magically get rid of all cavitation. Just remove that from your mind. It's just not the case. Okay? And, and what I'm showing you here is an extension of my, of my NPSH test. And I'm showing you the NPSH3 occurs at 19 feet in this example. The NPSH1 occurs at 25. The NPSH0 occurs at 63. The NPSH inception is at 107. That means that the, the, in order to completely suppress cavitation in this pump, we have to have an NPSH available that is about 5.5 5, 5 times the NPSHR. Okay, so I'll say that again. 5.5 5 times the NPSHR or the NPSH3. Now, I, I, I don't know of many pumps that operate with margins of 5.5. So the, the practical consequence of that is, is basically all pumps operate with cavitation. The only question is, is it damaging cavitation? Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. So what I'm going to do here, through the wonders of technology, we're going to do an NPSH test live on a webinar. It's never been done before. It's very exciting. So I'm going to show you this slide just to show you, because of the limitations of the technology, once the video that you'll see next starts running, I can't stop it. So I'm going to explain what we're going to do here. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a little star, and that is going to track down the NPSH line. So basically, we're going to reduce the NPSH available to this pump, and we're going to, going to do pull an NPSH knee. We're going to do an NPSH test. On the right-hand side is a video looking into a very special uh, test pump we have where you can actually look into the impeller eye and through the magic of, of stroboscopic uh, video, we can actually freeze it in position. And I've highlighted where the vein leading edge is on this impeller and the impeller rotation. And what you'll see streaming back from that is cavitation. But the thing I want you to note is we're starting well above NPSH3 here. We're starting at about 70 feet. Give, keep in mind that the NPSH3 is around 19 in this pump. So let's run the video and see what happens. So here we go. Hopefully people can see it. And what you can see streaming back from the vein leading edge is cavitation, which we're catching through the, the, the strobe. It's basically freezing everything in position. You can see... As we reduce the NPSH, that, the size of that, that uh, cavitation is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But it was always there, which is my point that, that you know, it, for all practical pumps, you're going to have cavitation. So now we're at the 1% head drop, and you can see the cavitation field is getting pretty large now. It's streaming back from the vein, and we're approaching the 3% head drop. And... You know, you can see the, the cavities, vapor cavities are now almost filling 
the, the field of view. That's a 3% head drop now, and now we're going to go into complete head breakdown and everything just goes sort of fizzy, like that. Okay, so that's an example of, of what happens in, in a real pump, in a real situation. So let's go on to the next slide. So let's talk about how MPSH40K uh, is determined. So MPSH40K, as, as I mentioned earlier, is the MPSH at which the impeller will have a 40,000 hour life. There's kind of three ways you can determine this. You can do physical testing, uh, where basically you build a scale or a full-size test rig of the impeller that you're interested in, and you run it, and, and you measure the, the, the damage that you get to the impeller. As you can imagine, this takes kind of a long time, and it's consequently rather costly. It tends to be reserved for very critical pumps, um, you know, such as advanced class boiler feed pumps and, and, and the like. There are two other ways you can do it. Uh, one of them is vlamming, which is a, an empirical method used for stainless steel impellers in water, where if you put in certain parameters associated with the uh, impeller into his equation, it will, um, you'll get a value out of it. And the other one is Gulick, which is based on uh, the size of the cavitation bubble and the impeller material. All of these methods require that you know stuff about the impeller geometry, and in some cases, performing CFD, which is really nothing that a uh, a, a customer of pumps can do. So the reality is if you, if you need MPSH 40K, you need to ask the pump supplier to provide this calculation for you. There really isn't any way out of that. And then my final, final thing I'm going to cover on MPSH before we, um, before we hop back to Rich, and I talk about the adjustment to MPSHR for the thermodynamic effect. So this is basically where, uh, as you, if you have a, a fluid with a high vapor pressure or a very high temperature fluid, the physics are such that the, the, the more energy has to be exchanged across the vapor to fluid boundary in the, at the, the, the interface of the bubble with the fluid, shall we say. And this is known as the thermodynamic effect or the hydrocarbon correction factor. Um, so what it means in practical terms is that the cavitation bubbles are smaller and you can reduce NPSHR by some amount. Um, I will note API, the API 610 does not allow you to consider this effect, even though it's a perfectly real effect. Uh, they used to years ago, but then they decided they didn't like it, and they got, they got rid of it and said you can't consider it. Uh, however, happily, Hydraulic Institute Standard 1.3 does give you guidance on this, and that graph that you can see on the right-hand side is actually from that standard. Um, and for those of you who don't believe that it's a real effect, try, try thinking about the critical point of a fluid. So for water, say you took water up to 374 Celsius or 705 Fahrenheit, you're at the critical point of water. You go any hotter than that, there is no um, liquid and gas. There's just a very light liquid or a very dense gas, and you can't have cavitation at all at that point. So as you get closer and closer to that, point, you're, you get this, this, what we call this thermodynamic effect, becomes more and more pronounced. Uh, and when you get to the critical point, you have no cavitation at all. Cav bubbles cannot exist. Cavitation bubbles cannot exist. So with that, uh, I realize I've kind of covered a lot of stuff. I'll let you recuperate, and Rich will tell you about the new Hydraulic Institute standard. Thank you, Simon. All right, so we've talked about cavitation. We've talked about uh, how to calculate NPSH available, and we've talked about how, as a pump manufacturer, we determine NPSH required. Uh, now let's talk about uh, comparing NPSH available and NPSH required and taking a look at what the Hydraulic Institute recommends as a margin, uh, you know, how much available you need to have for a given pump service or what you need to look for uh, out of a pump based on your NPSH available. So th this covers uh, the new Hydraulic Institute Standard 9.6.1, which was released in 2012. The original version was back in 2001, 
which was subsequently withdrawn in 03. And between 03 and 2012, there really has been no guidance uh, on what NPSH margin should be used. And a as a pump manufacturer, we really recommend that anybody involved in specifying or designing pump pumps or pumping systems should get a hold of this standard and go through it and be familiar with it. All right, this standard has guidelines for many of the, the common applications out there. The noted exceptions are pipeline services, uh, water injection, and nuclear services. But they do cover general industry, water and wastewater, pulp and paper, hydrocarbon processing, chemical processing, power gen, uh, HVAC building services, and slurry handling. So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a wastewater pump with a cast iron impeller, uh, and that's important to note, and you'll see why in a couple of slides. Uh, in this example, we have a power of less than 45 kilowatts per stage. Uh, we have a preferred operating range, NPSH margin ratio, of the greater of the two, whether it be 1.1 times your required or an additional one meter or 3.3 feet. In the allowable operating range, you're looking at the greater of 1.2 uh, multiplier or 1.5 meters. All right. So we'll take a look at an, at an example here. The pump has an NPSH3 or an NPSH required of 15 feet at best efficiency point and 29 feet at run out or 125% of best efficiency point. So at best efficiency point, you're in the preferred operating range. So the margin is the greater of the 15 feet required times 1.1 or the 15 feet plus 3.3 feet. And in this case, it's 3.3 feet margin and your uh, NPSH available should be a minimum of 18.3 feet. Consequently, at run out at 125% of best efficiency point, your margin is the greater of 29 feet times 1.2 or 29 feet plus 4.19. And in this case, it's the 1.2 and you should have 34.8 feet available. Another example, here we'll look at a boiler feed pump where your kilowatts per stage is greater than or equal to 225 and less than 500. Your preferred operating range margin is 1.2. And in this case, they don't give you an option. It is simply 20% more. Uh, and your allowable operating range margin is 1.5. So in this case, we have an NPSH3 or an NPSH required of 32.8 meters at best efficiency point. And we'll change it up a little bit on you. Our NPSH required is 24.2 at 60% of best efficiency point. Okay, so this is outside your preferred range, but it's in your allowable range, but it's back left on the curve. At best efficiency point, your margin is 32.8 times 1.2, which is 39.4 meters. And back at 60%, the margin is 24.2 times 1.5, which is 36 meters. Now, let's take a look at the wastewater one again and compare the wastewater pump with an iron impeller versus a wastewater pump with a stainless impeller. And this is where you have to uh, consider the uh, overall system cost, okay? So now you look at the, the margins that we have up there the cast iron is the same, okay? 1.1 multiplier or one meter, and in the allowable range, it's 1.2 or 1.5. But with the stainless steel impeller, you now have a lower margin because if you remember from Simon's slide before, the stainless is much less susceptible to uh, cavitation damage. So we have a different set of uh, margin requirements. So in this case, in the preferred operating range, it's 1.05 or one meter. 
and then the allowable range is 1.1 or one and a half meters. Okay? So now, as as a user or a, a, a engineering contractor, a pump specifier, you need to take into account the additional cost of that stainless impeller with the lower margin required. And if that overall system cost is lower, it could be lower with a stainless steel impeller if that allows you less excavation and smaller pipe work. And by excavation, we're talking about setting up the installation for that particular pump. If you have to lower that pump below grade to increase your suction head to get enough NPSH margin, that stainless impeller could be a drop in the bucket cost-wise compared to the costs incurred for having to do some deeper excavation and some below-grade installations. Now, what happens if there still is not any guidance on NPSH margin? Well, for pumps with a suction-specific speed of 11,000 or less using water, uh, the equation shown there is a reasonable uh, estimate of the margin required within the preferred operating range. And it's important to note that this is a formula, it's been simplified a bit, but it's a formula that we have developed that we use internally here. Uh, there's a lot of numbers, it looks a little complicated, but really you're only looking for a couple different pieces of information to plug into the equation. So your NPSH margin is your M sub NPSH, and that's what you're calculating. And you're using U1, which is the rotational speed of the impeller eye in feet per second. And that's where this, this variable comes in. You remember before from the, uh, the poll question, uh, we use this in part of our estimate. And the NPSH3 or the NPSHR of the pump at the operating point in feet. So again, taking a look at an example, okay, here we have a pump on a water service at uh, two pole speeds, 3560 RPM, with a seven inch impeller eye and an NPSH required of 26 feet. So your eye velocity in feet per second is pi D times your RPM, and you go through some units conversion there, you end up with 109 feet per second. So you put 109 feet per second in where it's calling for U1, and you put in your 26 feet where it's looking for your NPSH3. You simplify that equation, you come up with a margin multiplier of 1.91. Uh, this certainly is not insubstantial. Okay? This is almost double your NPSH required. Uh, but if you compare that to the same pump if it were on oil at 400 Fahrenheit, it would only need a margin of about 1.15. Okay. So it's, uh, it, it's important to pay attention to uh, the fluid you've got and uh, the values that you're using in this equation. Okay, so <clears throat> let, let's, let's recap and then we'll go to questions because I can see there's a few people champing at the bit to ask things. So the key takeaways from from the presentation from Rich and myself is <clears throat> cavitation is present in basically every pump. The, the real question is whether it's damaging or not. The new HI standard, 9.6.1, is there to provide you, the users, with guidance on how much margin is required to sufficiently suppress cavitation. You're not going to get rid of it but it suppresses it sufficiently so that you can achieve reliability in your application. And the third takeaway is if you know, proper material selection in the pump can reduce your margin requirements and consequently you know, may reduce your life cycle costs. So you need to look at the cost of the material in the pump and the cost of the system. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Greg. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're gonna take questions after that. Thank you, Simon and Rich, for your presentation. We have uh, just about 15 minutes for questions from the audience, and we have several that have started to come through. Our first question is, how close to BEP should normal operation be? 80%, 90%? What do the experts think? <laughs> 
Well, you want me to tell you that? Or I, you take it. Go I, I'll start and you can add. Yep. Ideally, you'd want it right on top of best efficiency point. Uh, you know, past that, I'd say as close as you can get. Uh, certainly 80% is, uh, is acceptable, 90% is acceptable, uh, you know, really anything within the acceptable range, but, you know, you, you, would, you would want to get to the, to the preferred range. Yeah, so I'd, I'd add that um, there's a few standards out there that, that define this stuff. The, 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 the POR, according to API, is, is 70 to 120% of BEEP. Uh, and it's the same according to HI as a standard, which I cannot remember the number for, but they they have the same POR, except if it's a very high specific speed pump, in which case it's 80 to 110. Um, and I cannot remember where the breakaway is. I think it's at 3000 NS. Um, API also requires you to select between 80 and 110, um, re regardless. Now, as Rich said, closer the closer the BP, the better. I will note for the, since we're talking about NPSH, um, selecting beyond BAP is probably not a good thing because your NPSH of your pump tends to can rise quite steeply beyond that. Um, so you may be struggling to achieve your margin. Hope that answered it. Great, thank you. Our next question from the audience, is there any empiric equation to estimate NPSHR if you can't get the pump curve? Yes. Um, you can use, um, the easy way to do it is just to use the equation for suction specific speed, which is basically uh, the speed of the pump times the square root of the flow divided by um, <clears throat> NPSHR raised to the three-quarter power and just rearrange the equation to solve for NPSH. And if you want to plug in conservatively a suction specific speed of um, 8,000 in, in US units, which is, I don't know, 160-ish in, in metric, um, you, can, you can calculate for a given pump and flow rate what, what you what would be a reasonable NPSHR. If you want to be a little less conservative, you could use an 11,000 figure, which is, I think, 213 in metric or even higher. But, you know, 8,000 is, is kind of, you, you probably won't break things if you do that. Um, that's that's kind of low at the low end. Uh, most pumps are going to generally do better than that. Um, so that's how I would do it if you've got no other information to go on. Um, Better to ask the manufacturer, but if you're wanting to size the thing, that's that's how I would go about it, just from a system standpoint. Thank you, Simon. Our next question for uh, Simon and Rich is: How do you determine the NPSH inception? How do you determine it? Well, you, you kind of have to measure it there, and by measure it, you can use the the uh, something like a test rig. That, that we showed earlier with where you look into the eye of the impeller and you see when the cavitation starts to occur. The other way you can measure it is to use CFD and simulate it, uh, do a simulation of the impeller. Um, you know, most manufacturers now, at, at least I would say that the, the bigger manufacturers can, can you know, are pretty familiar with simulating using CFD. Uh, we use it routinely. Um, and that's that's much much easier uh, and much less time consuming than building a test rig. But in the old days, that's what you had to do. Back in the the 70s and 80s, that was the only option available to you. Great. Our next question from the audience is: What standard should those in pipeline look for at MPSH margins if the HI? 9.6.1 takes exception to the pipeline. Depends where you're pumping. Um, assuming that the, the person asking the question was talking about a hydrocarbon pipeline as opposed to a water pipeline. Um, hydrocarbons generally you don't have a lot of issues, so usually a 15% margin is good enough. Um, however, if a lot of time in pipelines, you're talking about pretty large pumps with high power inputs. 
And I mean, what I would suggest is that there aren't that many companies that supply pumps to pipelines. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to rattle off a few of them, ourselves included. But generally, they're going to be able to give you guidance on what they would recommend as well. And you know, seeing as you're probably spending a great deal of money with them, uh, I think it would be you know, reasonable to also ask the, the manufacturer for their, their specific guidance. That formula that Rich showed you, uh, we have, a, a, as he alluded to, a more complicated version of that, uh, actually significantly more complicated, where we, would, we can calculate you know, four conditions depending on what the fluid is and a, and a lot of other stuff. So if, for example, the person asking the question were to buy a pipeline pump from us, we could give him that answer very quickly. Um, but if you have nothing else to go on, for medium to small, smaller pumps in pipeline service, 15% on hydrocarbons is pretty reasonable. For water pipelines, it's much, much higher. And there you really need to calculate it. Thank you. Next question is, how do you recommend calculating NPSHA for carbonated beverages like beer or soft drinks? Well, you know, my experience really comes from uh, pulp and paper and chemicals. So looking at that, the first thing I think of is, uh, you know, a, a flotation cell for de-inking. Uh, it has entrained gas, which is just what, you know, a carbonated beverage would have. So the way we approach that is the NPSH really doesn't change. It's just that you have to account for the loss of head uh, going through the pump because some of the energy that you're putting into the pump that would normally go to moving the, the fluid from point A to point B, some of that energy is now being used to collapse those CO2 bubbles. Uh, so the first thing I would ask is what's your uh, CO2 concentration? And then from there apply the, the correction factors and really what you end up with is a larger, possibly a larger pump, certainly a larger impeller diameter, but from an NPSH standpoint, that doesn't really change. You'd look at your, your suction side, uh, take a look at your uh, pressure on the surface of the fluid and your static height and you know, plug and chug through the equations. But in general, the NPSH isn't gonna change, but you do have to account for the air content and the fluid, or the gas content. Thank you, Rich. We've got about five minutes left, enough time for a couple more questions. Our next one from the audience is, what about extra clearance because of using stainless material? Would that affect NPSH? Um, it can, yes. Uh, it, depends on, it depends a lot on the pump design, uh, the specific speed of the pump, uh, and the design of the wearing or the, the close clearance. We do know of situations because we we see them on on some designs, uh, particularly where you have a, a a an axial clearance that jets the fluid directly into the uh, perpendicular to the the fluid coming into the eye. That that can have a, a negative consequence to NPSH. Um, but for for most pumps with a uh, a radial wearing. I would say the answer is no. Um, it, it, it generally is not going to be so much of a problem. But but if you have a if you have a pump type with axial clearances, then um, the answer is maybe. It, maybe it would. I, th I think you'd have to. It, that would become very a very specific situation that you'd have to ask the the manufacturer of that pump. Um, whether they would have a different NPSHR for uh, one material versus another, and they should be able to answer that question. That's it. Great, thank you. We have another question. How do solids influence the NPSH calculation? Uh, they don't. Uh, it, it affects your pump life, it affects your material selection. It certainly, depending on the, the concentration of solids, can affect your, uh, your pump selection, whether you're looking at a slurry pump or a process pump. Uh, 
but from an NPSH calculation standpoint, you know, I'm going to sound a lot like that uh, carbonated beverage answer. Uh, you just go back to the NPSH available equation. Uh, it's the pressure on the surface of the liquid and the, and the static height and the, and the vapor pressure and the, the head losses. But the, the addition of solids, uh, you know, providing they, they stay in suspension, it does not have an effect. Thank you, Rich. And uh, this is our final question for uh, the session. How do we account for trimming impellers after purchasing the pump when it comes to calculating a new NPSH? So when you trim in, in, an impeller of a pump, um, it can have an, a negative consequence for the NPSHR of the pump, uh, particularly, particularly higher specific speed pumps where the I'm going to sound geeky, the vein loading is quite high uh, and the overlap between veins is small. As you trim those, what you will typically see is that the, the MPSHR will be higher and will, will rise earlier than it would be with a full diameter impeller. So in terms of how you account for it, the, the supplier of the pump you are buying should have curves that show that effect. Um, as, as the impeller is trimmed so that if you have a, if, for example, you have a future condition where you know you're going to want to trim the impeller and you would know what the, what the new NPSHR of the pump is going to be for that future condition and you could design for it or select a pump that, that meets your requirement. Thank you, Simon and Rich. This has been a very informative session. I want to remind the audience that I know that there are plenty of questions that we did not get to, so we do plan to share a question and answer summary via email in the very near future, so please be on the lookout for that. We've reached the end of the hour. We would like to thank everyone for attending this live webinar event. We'd also love to hear your feedback on today's presentation so that we can continue to offer the most relevant educational information in our future webinar events. Please take a minute to complete, complete our short survey, which appears as a link on your screen right now. This concludes today's conference. The webinar will also be archived online at www.gouldpumps.com by the middle of the week. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.